Hello friends all across the world, I'm Phil Nosworthy and it is really wonderful to be with you here now. Whether you're watching live or whether you're tuning in at a later point, because I know that everybody's watching now live, but I imagine that some of you are joining after we are finished here today as well. Regardless of how you're joining with us, I'm honored to be here with you. And I want to share a couple of thoughts with you. Now, I want to be clear here right at the start that these thoughts are for you as much as they are for your clients and your partners. But as we begin, uh, I think it is necessary to call this for what it is, 2020. What a wild time, huh? Unexpected, unpredictable, very real challenges. Emotions are high, stress is very, very high. And here in Australia, let alone wherever you are on the planet, whether it's been fire or flood or worldwide pandemic and economic collapse, worldwide social upheaval, locusts in Africa. Is anybody watching this? It seems that life has thrown us all every potential and possible curveball in 2020. And so over the months of this year, I've been advising partners around the world and even suggesting to friends the exact same strategy, and that is to rise above the emotional chaos of the current moment. It's something that is far easier to say than it is to do, but the importance of it is significant. You see, we cannot lead others effectively if we're not first leading ourselves. We know this, that leaders who cannot manage their own emotional turbulence, they actually have very little to offer others at moments like this. And that's always been the case, but my goodness, hasn't that truth been so clearly laid bare in businesses and organizations all across the world right now? This is a time for leadership genuinely like no other, perhaps unique, in the history of our species, in Jungian psychology, and I really like the work of Carl Jung, the archetype of the king and queen, which are the dominant characterizations of the leader within you. It's a story that is told around what it looks like to be a great leader. Those two archetypes, those two characters, they're defined by two wonderful virtues. If you're taking notes, these are two words to just commit to paper right now. Calm, and dynamic. Let me say it again. Calm and dynamic. That's the the virtues of great leadership. I mean, have you ever met a leader like that? They could be carrying the weight of the entire organization on their shoulders, but they remain calm and they remain open to possibility. And these are the two virtues that allow innovation and new thinking to thrive. Your ability to innovate and inspire energy and action Man, that's vital right now. And as it turns out, being calm is as contagious in teams as panic and despair and bitterness. And so our ability to rise above the chaos and to lead ourselves personally is critical, not only just for ourselves, but for the people that we impact. And, and I guess this is my work. I work in very deep ways with teams at organizations of significance to amplify personal and emotional leadership in ways that accelerate personal fulfillment, leadership impact, and the performance of teams. After all, we never go professionally where we are afraid to go personally. And you see, there is a perfect correlation between who you are right now and how you will lead at moments like this. The masterwork of leadership at all times will always be found in ways that people are willing to lead themselves. And the same goes for you. This is not just for them because you know that for your team to be agile, you've got to be agile. And for your team to be empathetic, you've got to be empathetic. And for your clients to feel safe, that you've got to know how to create psychological safety, which means first and foremost being centered and calm yourself. I think the greatest illusion of the previous era of business before this pandemic was that technology was going to do the transformation work within organizations almost by itself. And we know that it can. We know that technology has extraordinary power, but we also know that it's always been leaders who transform organizations. Technology is just the tool that great leaders use. And so for all the conversations that have been had about organizational transformation, you and I both know that the real work of organizational transformation occurs in the lives of its leaders. This is significant. This is an important point. And I call this transformational shift towards personal leadership as the core art and skill and practice and craft of leadership, I call this idea convergence. 
because it doesn't so much teach new ideas or secrets of leadership. After all, the clients that you and I both work with, they have first class MBAs and decades of experience in their chosen fields. These are smart people. This is not about some hidden secret that if only I knew that, then everything would work for me. No, no, no. This idea of convergence, it activates people's latent genius. It brings to life the potential that they have, the sleeping and dormant potential that already exists in their lives, but it does it in predictable, but if I'm being honest, always extraordinary ways. With this beautiful line of thinking, this idea of convergence, we teach people how to harness their skill by focusing on their character. We teach them how to do less better by putting what they already know into practice before they uh, get addicted to new information that they do, don't do anything with. We teach leaders how to prime performance and the impact by elevating their levels of forethought and preflection. We switch on self-reflection in ways that really genuinely stun people. And we work to activate courage where sometimes it's hard to find and the results are measurable. This is the coolest part. One client, uh, who I would regard as uh, possessing one of the highest profile executive leadership teams in this country, in Australia. And it would be a leadership team whose work reverberates through similar industries around the world. They saw, by putting convergence into practice, they saw group stress drop by almost 12%. Empathy within that leadership group soared by almost 40% which is essential in the world right now. For anybody watching the news, you know the value and the utility and the need for empathy in all that we do right now. And among other results, perceived social isolation dropped by 30%. Now that means that leaders knew they weren't out there on their own, that they had genuine psychological safety in one of the highest and most publicly scrutinized leadership teams in the country. And so that's what I wanna showcase with you today that there are genuine upsides to this quest for real and authentic leadership that is more about the substance of who you are than it obsesses with new skills and the ways that that kind of approach cascades to teams and to cultures. And yes, to the bottom line is very, very real, but it all starts with personal and emotional leadership. And to understand convergence well, I think we should be smart to start with Viktor Frankl's timeless wisdom, which has given extraordinary power to countless people over the years all across the planet. He suggests this, that between stimulus and response, that there's a gap, that if expanded creates wisdom and freedom for us in our lives. And we've got to then take full responsibility for our own selves. And this doesn't negate the unique challenges or the privileges of every single person on this call, but it does challenge us to deal with life as it presents itself to us through our circumstances. And Frankel, if he was here with us, he would go on to say something like this. Everything can be taken from someone, but one thing, and that's the last of the great human freedoms, and that is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. It's so critical. Why? Because we can't control what happens outside of us. But it is our full and complete responsibility to control how we respond to it. If he were here with us, he might go on to say this. Every day, every hour, we are offered the opportunity to make a decision. A decision which determines whether we would or would not submit to powers which threaten to rob us of our own selves, our inner freedoms. Powers which determine whether or not we're will end up as the plaything of circumstance. Now those initial responses to what happens to us in life, they're critical for what will happen throughout our lives. But all this talk about, you know, uh, emotional leadership and expanding the gap between stimulus and response, it does remind me of an ancient tale and, and it's one that I want to share. It's an ancient Chinese tale about a farmer with one horse and one son. Maybe you've heard this one. It's a classic. It's, it's, it's been around for a long time and for very good reason. Now this farmer, one horse, one son, he had very little, but over the years he had learned peacefulness and contentment. But one day his only horse, it broke free and it ran away. And his neighbors, they came around immediately saying, what terrible fortune. The gods obviously don't favor you. To which he could only respond, 
Maybe. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, the next day, his horse returned. But when he came back, his horse was leading 50 wild horses that he and his son were able to round up and secure in a pen. Now, of course, his neighbors rushed over to say, what good fortune. The gods obviously favor you highly. To which you could only respond, maybe. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, the next day, his son was breaking in one of those wild ponies, but he fell off the horse and he broke his leg. Now his neighbors came back around and you can imagine what they were going to say. They said this, what terrible fortune. Clearly, fortune has abandoned you. To which he could only respond, maybe. I guess we'll have to wait and see. And the day after that, this is the fourth day, the king's guard came to the house to enlist his son because a great and bloody war had broken out all across the empire, but his son couldn't enlist for war because of his broken leg. He was saved from almost certain death. Now, once again, the man's neighbors came around saying, what incredible fortune. Clearly, this was fate's plan all along, to which the man replied, and now you know the rhythm of this tale, maybe. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, I love this old story because it reminds me not to jump to conclusions about what is working for me or what is working against me in life. Right now, life has thrown you a curveball. There's no doubt about it. Something unexpected, something that you could not or did not anticipate. The wisdom involved here is to expand the space between stimulus and response. The encouragement here at the basis, the foundations of emotional leadership is to hold off on our split and emotional assumptions of to whether this is going to be a good thing or a bad thing. And this is where Frankel would remind us that what happens to us in life is not what defines us. Instead, our responses to those things, that's what defines us. This is a time for learning to manage our emotional responses to what's happening to us. And with time, and despite the very real challenges, no one's making light of that. But I do have a hunch there's going to be things inside this moment that in time we will be grateful for. And to achieve this, there's a very real imperative to create more space in our lives for reflection and growth. Now, Joseph Campbell, the anthropologist, he might say something like this, that this is an absolute necessity for anybody today. You've got to have a room or a certain hour in your day where you don't know what's in the newspapers that morning where your mind can peel away from the drama of the day, where you can just step outside of your own ecosystem and bubble, a time in each day where you can simply be and bring out what you are and what you might be. And this is the place of creative incubation. This is where leadership is formed. You might find at first that not a whole lot happens in that space, but eventually something indescribable will happen. It's fair to say that very recently, our life has become so economical and practical in its orientation that as we get older, the claims of the moment upon us are so great that we hardly know where on earth we are or what it was that we intended. We're always doing something that's required of us. So taking time every day to just sit and be in silence and in that time asking ourselves simple questions. Who am I? How am I showing up to life? What do I want from my life today? How do I move forward? Then letting go and letting a stream of consciousness and our deep and earned intelligence just let it supply the answers. Then write them down and do this every day. You'll be surprised at how situations and circumstances and events and people will orchestrate themselves around those answers. Simple questions have extraordinary power, far more power, I believe, than the supposed insights of experts. That's not to undermine the work of others, but we are the ones that must decide for ourselves. And you have more than enough wisdom for what you're here to do, and it's a matter of bringing that to the surface and putting it into practice. This is a recipe for doing less better. So let me say that again. This is a moment in business and life to do less better. And so my simple ask of leaders then is to spend an hour a day in the development of themselves. Most have spent at least six years in full-time study, countless hours in skill-based acquisition, but very few direct time or attention to the deliberate development of their character, to listening to and cultivating that quiet wisdom that's so instrumental in the times that matter most. And it's that substance, the depth of our character, that either amplifies or nullifies our skill. In that way, we might be the most skillful person in the room, but if we're prone to bouts of anger, 
defensiveness. We're, we're unable to listen to the opinions of others for the fragility of our ego. Or if we back away from challenges, when times call for us to lean in, then all the skill in the world will be unable to take us to where we wish to go. 